And a warm welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to our program, Talk on World Restart a Hard Day and CPR and AED. My name is Samson Z, your program host. And joining me today, we have Prof Lim Sui Han, Senior Consultant, Department of Emergency Medicine at Singapore General Hospital. He's also the Chairman of the Singapore Resuscitation and First Aid Council, or SRFAC. And joining us today as well, we have Mr. Eric Lee, Volunteer Principal Chief Instructor and AED Training Consultant with Singapore Heart Foundation. He's also the Life Saving Auditor of Singapore Resuscitation and First Aid Council. Ladies and gentlemen, the World Restart a Heart is a global initiative launched by the International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation. Their aim is to increase awareness of the importance of bystander CPR and to increase bystander CPR rates worldwide. The celebration of World Restart a Heart Day is held annually on 16 of October, led by the Singapore Resuscitation and First Aid Council. Now this year, the focus will be on hands-only CPR training and important action to save lives from cardiac arrest globally. So let's begin our first question for today, directed to Prof Lim. Can you tell us what is the World Restart a Heart Initiative and how did the World Restart a Day come about? And also, can you share with us what is the involvement of the Singapore Resuscitation and First Aid Council in this initiative? A European Resuscitation Council, which is a scientific organization that advises the Europe countries in the resuscitation guideline, started this uh, Restart a Heart Initiative uh, in 2013. This is because uh, in cardiac arrest, this is to say that the heart stopped beating. If nothing was done, uh, example, chest compression, for every minute bus, uh, that passes, uh, the survival rate will drop about 10%. However, if someone do the CPR, then it will decrease the, the drop in survival rate to about 2 to 3% per minute. Most of the cardiac arrest, 70% of them uh, occur, it's a weakness event. This is to say that uh, someone actually noted the cardiac arrest in most of the time in residents, uh, also in working places or public places. If uh, the public can come forward to help, you know, it, it will uh, improve the survival for cardiac arrest. In 2018, International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation or UCOR uh, also adopted this uh, Restart the Heart initiative and hence now we know as uh, World Restart the Heart Day. SRFAC is a member of a Resuscitation Council of Asia and in turn, RCA is a member of UCOR. Thank you for the answer. Now, Prof Lim, also with the fact from 2016, mouth-to-mouth -mouth ventilation is no longer required. For CPR AD provided certification courses and also learners are only required to learn and perform hands-only CPR. Now, what is the primary reason for the change? There are several reasons. You know, uh, uh, one of the reasons is that, you know, for public uh, or lay rescuer, uh, when they encounter uh, someone with cardiac arrest, usually they are alone. So there are many things to be done uh, concurrently. And we want to make this uh, resuscitation process as simple as possible, you know, so that uh, this is increase the confidence of the public as well as improve uh, skill re tension after training. Actually, it's quite complicated, you know, if someone encounter, uh, uh, someone witness a cardiac arrest event, uh, first, he have to willing to come out to help, you know, uh, to approach the victim, you know, to, to witness that, to, to ensure that the victim is uh, unconscious, you know, so hello, hello, are you okay? And after that, the second step, uh, he have to call 995. It, once they activate the 995, you know, the Singapore Civil Defence Emergency Ambulance Dispatch Centre, uh, they will follow the instruction of the dispatcher. You know? So the dispatcher usually will ask them to check whether the patient is breathing normally. You know? So if not breathing normally, then uh, they have to position the victim, face up position, you know, supine position, then uh, locate the landmark for chest compression. You know, and then start this chest compression. And also, if there's an AED nearby, uh, the dispatcher may also ask the rescuer to go and get an AED first if it's nearby. So, so you see, it's quite complicated, you know. So, so actually, to start chest compression and, and uh, do the chest compression properly is, is really a major undertaking. Okay? So, uh, scientifically, mouth-to-mouth uh, -mouth ventilation do help. How, how, however, uh, chest compression, uh, in a cardiac arrest, the chest compression benefit is much higher. And, and for, for, uh, for 
mouth to mouth is also a very complicated, more difficult task to be trained, you know. And also the public also have uh, the uh, burden, you know, that's uh, because of personal hygiene. You know, most people do not want to do uh, mouth to mouth ventilation on on a stranger. E even if they learn how to do mouth to mouth. Uh, uh, resuscitation when come to a cardiac arrest they start thinking whether they want to do and and after they make up their mind they may not able to do uh, it properly you know so 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 because of all this delay they do much lesser chest compression do chest compression only CPR or hands only CPR it, it will it will improve the survival rate of the cardiac arrest victim because it will encourage more people to learn this chest compression skill because it is simpler I see. Fantastic. What a, what a great answer with lots of information and data as well. Okay, now question to both gentlemen as well. How does the removal of mouth-to-mouth -mouth ventilation make an impact on the learning outcome? And perhaps maybe to Eric as well, if you can help me with this. Uh, has the Singapore Heart Foundation started offering hands-only CPR training? Perhaps Mr. Mr. Prof probably can answer. Before we implemented chest compression only CPR, we did a local study you know, on, on a group of first-year uh, the nursing students who have not learned CPR before, you know, so we randomized them. You know, one group learned the conventional CPR, chest compression with mouth-to-mouth -mouth ventilation. The other group just do chest compression. So the result is that those group which learn the chest compression only CPR, they are able to do a better chest compression. You know, there's less interruption. You know, for for those who are learning the chest compression only CPR with mouth-to-mouth uh, -mouth, uh, ventilation, uh, they found that you know there's a lot of interruption that means because they have to go and perform the mouth-to-mouth -mouth ventilation even those who are performing mouth-to-mouth -mouth ventilation is not effective because it's quite a, a difficult skill to learn you know mm. well i'm sure a lot of people like to find out more about this uh, amazing skill and already i would say skill and 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 techniques as well now to eric has the singapore heart foundation started offering hands-only cpr training oh yes uh singapore heart foundation actually annually they organize project heart in uh, somewhere August or October or so, okay. And uh, last year, they did take on the first uh, initiative to actually run a certification course on hands-only CPR. Past year, they did uh, MTM, mouth-to-mouth. -mouth. So last year, they actually did an hands-only. And it was quite well received by the public. And the passing rate was uh, 98%. It's quite high. So it has proven that the skill is easily accepted by the public and being practiced and uh, they pass through the certification. I just want to supplement, you know, just now about the study. In fact, we test, test, the, uh, test the participant, you know, six months later, you know, we give them a surprise test. And, and that the result shows that those who learn uh, chest compression, only CPR, can retain the, the chest compression skill much better, you know. Mm. Interesting. Now, also, Prof Lim, very important question that we'd like to find out as well. What are the chances of fracturing a victim's ribs when performing chest compression? Actually, it is uh, not uncommon to fracture someone's rib during a chest compression. Maybe 20 to 30 percent, you know, uh, of the start of the post mortem study. What I want to emphasize is that you know, fracture ribs is not a, it's not a, uh, it's not a fatal event because the fractures will heal by itself. Uh, however, if you don't do any chest compression on the uh, victims, you know, the chances of survival after 10 minutes is almost 0%. I see. As you mentioned earlier as well, it's better to, uh, to revive and maybe have a bit of harm, but you, you might revive the victim better than not revived at all. And, and also, unfortunately, you know, although we have a very efficient uh, emergency ambulance services, you know, but because of the structure of a city you know we, we are very uh impact uh, we are very compact and there's a lot of tall buildings so it you know in average it takes about 10 minutes to arrive the victims once the call is being made you know so so that 10 minutes is very important you know if the public can act then I mean, even the fastest uh, ambulance may not be able to reach there in time yes, to revive yes, yes. I see. Now to Mr. Eric, we have the Good Samaritan Initiative. Can you tell us a bit more how it can help the bystanders and participating in this? Okay, uh, I understand there's a lot of people who actually, before they help, they are concerned about legal impact on them. But uh, unfortunately, Singapore don't have a good written law. But uh, to say liability on someone who actually step forward out of goodwill and good faith and do the necessary to actually help a person, 
uh, should should not be too serious. Or in fact, why I say too serious because it play with the skill set and the reasonable person. If you had learned CPR before, your skill is there, your skill set. And you are a reasonable person who actually did a reasonable step in your CPR and helped someone to do chest compression. I mean chest compression directly here, not here, definitely. If you couldn't do here, you will be sued. You no doubt. And then but if it's on the right place and you did your part, I think uh, under you, you are protected as a good Samaritan rather than you 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 were afraid of me. So uh Put a, beside that, as for criminal liability, they're even not close to it because to prove you criminal liability, you must be proven that you have ill intention. But if you are stepping out, out of good faith and you don't even know the person and you're helping the person, this is practically unable to prove your ill intention. So this part, I hope that when there's emergency, those that learned CPR before really step forward and just put your hand together and do hands only to you know, help someone that actually suffering from cardiac arrest. Mm, that's yeah. a very, very good explanation. That's right. So viewers, don't forget, if you happen to be outside, go ahead and uh, you know continue hand-to-hand -hand, uh, application to, so that you can resuscitate alive and not worry about uh, the other issues that you might yes. have. Yeah? And, and also, you know, there's also skill retention. So so uh, if, if someone passed a, a CPR course, you know, after a few months, they, you know, they, they may not do the perfect uh, CPR when they uh, call to uh, call into action, you know. Uh, although there's no good Samaritan laws, but I think our Singapore legal system is fair. You know, it will protect those who came up to help and with a good intention. Okay, question for both of our guest speakers today. Now, annually, more than two thousand four hundred Singaporeans suffer from cardiac arrest. Now, as of 2016, the out-of-hospital cardiac arrest or OHCA survival rate is only 23.4%. Now, what do you think we can do to improve the OHCA survival rate in Singapore? To improve the survival of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, uh, the most important is to get all the, Sing all the residents, Singapore residents to learn uh, CPR. And in the school, uh, they already have this uh, DARE program Dispatcher assisted first responder in secondary one. They learn a short uh, one hour courses on chest compression only CPR and also AED. Uh, while the dispatcher will uh, uh, instruct them what to do. And also for the gentlemen, you know, uh, we have uh, national service liability and uh, we uh, learn uh, hands only CPR course in the national service. Hopefully, uh, for, for the rest, and also for those uh, who have learned uh, hands-only CPR during national service, they could also take up a recertification course uh, after, after that, you know, to, uh, to sort of continue the skill. Well, thank you, Prof Lim. Now, also to Mr. Eric as well, we also understand we have the CPR kiosk and also the non-certification courses. Now, can you elaborate a bit more how this can also help? Okay, the CPR kiosk and uh, those non-certification courses are actually more to, with the intention of retaining the skill set. So you look at it if there's a kiosk, instead of every two years, then you touch the mannequin one and try to, you know, mean refresh or maintain the skill set. You can practically at any time you just drop by to the kiosk and refresh your skill set. So I, I think skill set is important to be, you know, retained and uh, quality compression has to be really maintained. And that will actually help in the surviving rate. It's, uh, all right. Now, one more question for you, sir. Now, during the COVID-19 pandemic, is it still safe to perform CPR? And do you have any safety tips to the audience? It is safe to perform CPR on a cardiac arrest victim during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, this is because the uh, prevalence of uh, COVID-19 in a patient with cardiac arrest is very, very low. Uh, there is uh, advisory for lay rescuer during uh, COVID-19 situation in the SRFAC uh, website. Uh, basically, uh, when they hand over the cardiac arrest victims to the uh, paramedics, remember to disinfect the, disinfect the hands and they can get some disinfectant from the paramedics. And also, if they are unwell after the event, please go and seek medical help. 
Thank you. That is a, a great safety tip for the audience to, to understand as well. Now, back to Mr. Eric as well. Now, while the ambulance is on the way uh, and the person is doing some hand compression and he gets very tired, what is your advice? What should he do? Oh, yes, yes, it's tiring doing compression. So what you can actually do is if you are really alone and there's no other people who actually can help, you can take a, a pause, but not more than 10 seconds just to catch up your breath and start your compression. Okay, but if there's any other third party around, or there's other bystander. Uh, uh, that's where we actually encourage uh, most of the uh, Singaporeans to come over to Singapore Heart Foundation if you can to to be trained in CPR this skill, so that at least we can rotate in helping someone who actually collapsed instead of some just one person doing and it's very hectic. So if there's third, three, you know, second or third person being trained, they can simply take over and just continue with the compression. And that will really benefit the patient. Yep. Thank you. I'll be the first to sign up for that. Uh, yes, thank you. <laughs> okay, to our panel speakers, it'll be, this will be our final question. Now, uh, what advice would you give to someone who witnessed a cardiac emergency? I think most important, they must be willing to come forward to help. You know, uh, what, what the, even call 995, you know, and that will and follow the dispatcher instruction, I think that will greatly improve the survivor of the cardiac arrest victim because if nothing was done, the survivor is 100% after 10 minutes. And and yeah, I think this would be my advice. And of course, if they can learn a, a simple, you know, a C, a hands-only CPR and AD courses, you know, I think that would be wonderful. And just to, just to add on, uh, I, I think the uh, Singapore resuscitation and First Aid Council have actually done a very good part in and half of Singapore Heart Foundation. Now, first, we have actually cleared the barriers of uh, mouth to mouth. Don't deny there's quite a number of them who are unwilling to do mouth to mouth. But now we, we emphasize on hands only, which is equivalent. Okay, secondly, uh, there's dispatcher instruction, which is will assist people who actually pick up the skill but are not in the healthcare or medical medical industry, they are frightened. They can follow the instruction. I think it's quite a good one. And that will give them confidence. <coughs> and third is simplified skill. So you look at it uh, when there's emergency. All this barrier has been removed. I, we, we actually think that the bystander can really have the guts to step forward and just press. Without all this barrier which previously was there to actually withhold someone back from doing CPR on any collapse case. Mm. Well, to our viewers, we've almost come to the end of our program, but here's more information for you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, statistics shows that 70 to 80% of cardiac arrest cases occur either at home or in public places. Now, in cases such, those present at the scene are able to provide CPR to victim promptly, and it can double the victim's chance of survival. So with that, we want to thank both of our guests for joining us today. And once again, thank you to Prof Lim Sui Han, the Senior Consultant, Department of Emergency Medicine at Singapore General Hospital, and also the Chairman of the Singapore Resuscitation and First Aid Council, or S. RFAC, and also thank you to Mr. Eric Lim as well, our volunteer, Principal Chief Instructor, BCLS, CPR, and AED Training Consultant, Singapore Heart Foundation. He's also the life-saving auditor of Singapore Resuscitation and First Aid Council. So with that, my name is Samson Z, your program host, saying thank you and goodbye.